Welcome in, ladies and gentlemen, to another edition of the Bengal Tiger Podcast. I'm Billy Embody. With me is Shay Dixon for our final official visit preview of the month of June. Uh, Shay, this is a big one for LSU. You know, you've come off a run of weekends that they've hosted some of their top targets, but you could argue that this weekend could be that make or break push into what would cement them as a top five class if you clean up in Louisiana, if you get the guys that are coming in this weekend or at least have a high shooting percentage. It's really got a chance to set you up well uh, going into the the back half of summer and when decisions are made. 100%. And I've got an article coming on Thursday to the Bengal Tiger that will break down every official visitor they had this month, how things went, where things have trended. And I'm with Billy. I have, I think we look back on this weekend, and if they were able to pop some of these five guys, it will be very notable in terms of not only a class ranking, but how well they fill out needs. Because, Billy, they've got five total visitors. Three of them are offensive linemen who have offers that are committable. One of them is a receiver target who's been out there forever, and another is a corner target who, let's say, over the past two months has emerged as maybe one of the top priorities they have. So. It, for me, this is about as big of a five-man group as you can have. And let's jump right into it, right? Uh, and Brad Davis has routinely, I would say, been out of the coaches, the one who probably casts the widest net, in a sense, of his uh, prospects that he goes after. He also gets a ton of them on campus. And this weekend, kind of similar to last summer, is no different. But let's lead off with the highest-ranked prospect, on on three, and that's Weston Davis, the offensive tackle out of Beaumont, Texas. He is really, when you talk to coaches and, and sources who have seen him in person lately, one of the best-looking prospects out there in the country. He's a two-sport standout. He plays basketball at Beaumont United, um, you know, and he sits there on the on three uh, rankings as the number 23 overall, uh, overall prospect in the country, number three offensive tackle nationally, number fifth ranked uh, prospect in Texas. Look, the Aggies lead the on three recruiting prediction machine, but LSU, Oklahoma, Alabama all seem to be in this one. But in terms of current SEC schools, it seems like A&M, LSU, and Alabama are battling it out for this one. Yeah, you see Beaumont, and you hope that that can help in terms of distance. Obviously, it's not too far of a drive from Baton Rouge. would allow family to see him. Uh, every home game, uh, obviously, you're going to be playing games in Texas now in the SEC with Texas and Texas A&M. So this is one where geographically it fits. And I know that when the LSU staff had gone out there and seen Weston Davis at Beaumont United, the word back was this kid's one of the best players in the country. And if you're watching on YouTube right now, you see his profile on three industry ranking, which is on three 24 seven ESPN rivals. Uh, has been at number seven on on three. We've got him as the number three offensive tackle in the country, a top 25 prospect, six, five, two sixty five. When college coaches are looking at best available offensive tackles or best committed offensive tackles, Weston Davis sits right atop that list. And for him to be uncommitted and to give LSU the final visit of the month, I think is all you can ask for uh, if you're the Tigers at this stage. I think the interesting thing with this one is going to be, can Alabama overcome the distance that LSU and A&M have at their advantage? Because LSU and A&M have really recruited Weston Davis better than any other school on his list. And Brad Davis was on Weston Davis way early. Um, one, one of his first offers uh, was from Brad Davis. And now you look at him and he's one of the top offensive tackles in the country. Um, but with that basketball background, you just love to see that. Um, just continues to help those type of guys move quickly, be light on their feet. Um, and, and I think his best football is just ahead of him. Uh, he wants to really redshirt when he gets to campus. He wants that development because he hasn't been playing football that long. Uh, so I think with the offensive tackle situation LSU has, this is a prospect where it really lines up well if LSU was able to get him. But again, you're talking about a top 25 overall prospect. 
it's going to be a battle. But Brad Davis is probably running a little hot right now after Marcus Muscol uh, committed to Florida. That was a guy LSU was really after and, and heavily involved with. But he ends up going to Florida. Weston Davis is much more highly recruited and ranked than Marcus is. But there's a little bit of you know motivation, I think, for Brad Davis to finish this month off strong. Yeah, and I'm not going to doubt Brad Davis for a second here after the O-line classes they put together in the past couple of years. Seeing Will Campbell and Emory Jones hold their own as offensive tackles as true freshmen. We've seen DJ Chester in person, who was one of the top out-of-state signees they were able to go get uh, this past cycle. I know Zalant's heard a five-star in Louisiana steals a lot of the headlines, but we saw when we were out at summer camp, DJ Chester hanging out. He looks college-ready right now. There's buzz that he could contribute early on in his career, whether that's this fall or or in year two. But I like what he's done on the recruiting trail. They've got the best Louisiana offensive lineman committed right now in Kyrie Lee. So the focus is on weekends like this, where you bring in three out-of-state guys, all of whom sit atop your wish list and see what you can do. I would rank Weston Davis as the guy that would move the meter the most for me if he committed. But all three of these guys are pretty talented. And speaking of talented, LSU is after another top 100 prospect in the state of Texas, and that that's Blake Ivey. And he's also relatively close by uh, to Baton Rouge. And this one is shaping up to be an, another LSU A&M battle. And if you look back at last year's recruiting cycle, Chase Basantis, TJ Shanahan, those were two of Brad Davis's top targets. And, you know, they end up going to Texas A&M. Weston Davis, Blake Ivey, you know, there's a chance that they end up in College Station. Um, but once again, uh, Brad Davis is really playing this one well to get that last visit. Blake Ivy is another prospect. We talked about Ori Williams, who has ties to Louisiana. Blake Ivy is another prospect that has ties to Louisiana and a lot of family in the state. So he sits there inside the top 100 on on three ranks as the number 78 overall prospect, number three interior offensive lineman, the 17th ranked prospect in the state of Texas. It just seems like with this one, that area is particularly good texas a&m for the most part but blake ivy keeps his cards close to the vest sometimes these type of prospects that are relatively quiet can be ones where maybe they're not tipping their hand like some of these other guys are maybe lsu sits in a better spot i think brad davis has a legit shot at blake ivy i think uh they have to knock out the knock the official visit weekend out of the park though yeah, you bring in the number three offensive tackle in the country and you bring in the number three interior offensive lineman, not too bad. Uh, Ivy is a guy who's a big-time player. We've said that we thought that it was going to be A&M LSU. It appears at least to be trending that way. I know you've said before you thought it was going to be a tough pull, that A&M was going to be able to have some real influence here uh, or at least be able to be a team that made a very big splash and fight for that role of on three RPM leader or the team to beat or uh, however you want to put it. That's no straight, you know, that's not lost on Brad Davis, which is why I think we saw another prospect they've been heavy on Zyron Brown, uh, New Orleans native who's playing down on the Gulf coast in Mississippi. He's being recruited by a number of colleges and he came straight up, um, you know, during our interview and told me, Hey, look, Brad Davis is after Blake Ivy. He's an interior offensive lineman like I am. He's right now got a scholarship offer, but if he picks Texas A&M, I'm one of those guys Coach Davis can turn to. He's evaluated me, potentially make an offer, and if an offer went in, he would commit. So with visits like this, we see where things go with Ivy. If they don't go in LSU's direction, Brad Davis has backup plans in place that we're even aware of uh, just from following recruiting and, and kind of tracking all of their top targets. So I think Brad Davis has done a good job of identifying the top guys, getting them to campus, but also having that next layer of guys come into camp, compete, let them get an eye on them to where no matter which way any of these guys go, he's going to come away with four or five offensive linemen he feels good about. No question about it. And look, I mean, for those who sit here early on, the first two or three, I promise we stacked them this way because the news gets better. Uh, but you want to be in these recruiting battles. You don't want to be getting guys like, I mean, there are prospects that LSU evaluates and then offers and gets, and you look at the offer list and sometimes you might say, eh, it's not much there, but you want to be in these types of battles. You want to be getting players that other people want. 
good players are not put on silver platters. And especially in the state of Texas, where it is so highly um, competitive to get some of these guys out of the state. And we've seen schools have success in Texas. We've seen LSU have some success in Texas. This is one of those prospects that is worth that type of competitive um, battle for. And so Brad Davis is one of the biggest grinders on the coaching staff. And I also feel like he has a good feel for how things are in the recruitments he's involved with. Um, you mentioned Zyron Brown being a backup. And Brad Davis is waiting to see how things go this weekend, probably, and then be able to make the move either way, depending on how things go and what the initial feedback is from Blake Ivy's camp. And then maybe we see an offer after that. Yeah, I'd said before that AM um, was a team that was battling for Ori Williams and Blake Ivy. I'd like to see LSU come away with one of them. Ori Williams told you that LSU's on top right now. He visited this past weekend. Now you've got Ivy in this weekend. If you throw in like that group right now, like Ivy Weston Davis, Ori Williams, there's Texas offensive linemen out there that he's been heavy on. Casey Poe is on campus right now. You got to come away with one of them. So I don't know if Ori Williams is your best shot, but it's clear to me that Brad Davis feels like I'm coming away with at least one of these guys, if not more than one, because he's got all of them now in on multiple visits, including this stretch of official visitors. So Texas O-lineman, interesting um, storyline to follow in this class because they're going to end up with, something, you know, at least one. And the one that I think LSU probably has the most, potentially the best chance to land, maybe outside of Weston Davis, but also it's just kind of quiet confidence on, you know, talking with sources with LSU, but this prospect is quiet in general. Uh, and that's Ethan Calloway out of North Carolina. Now, he's one of those prospects that doesn't really do interviews. Shea, you broke his entire official visit schedule. Uh, through sources. And now he comes to LSU for yet another visit. He's already been on campus before. LSU could use a guy with this type of size and I feel like versatility because six, seven, about 300 pounds doesn't necessarily grow on trees um, by any means. But he's been to Florida, he's been to Georgia, he's been to Penn State, and now he wraps things up with LSU. And I, I just get the sense that maybe LSU isn't being talked enough in, uh, about in this recruitment. Yeah, because it, it, and again, look, we also say things like, you know, he's from North Carolina. How often is he around? Um, look, I, you go to, I often say it, watch a kid's actions. Back in September, he came down for a game. That was the very first game Ethan Calloway went and saw this past season was a game down at LSU. What your goal from there is, let's get him back in the spring and then get him for an official. Well, I think it was in early April. He came back, made an unofficial visit, spent a couple of days on campus. And there was, I think there was just a lot going on. And it sort of felt to me like it got lost in the shuffle that, hey, there's a top 10 offensive tackle out there who gave you a game visit, gave you a spring unofficial visit, and is now giving you his final official visit in June and he's doing it being a kid from North Carolina. He doesn't have ties to LSU. He's not growing up in East Texas or Louisiana or South Mississippi. So Brad Davis getting in here, I thought was key early. It's clear the staff as a whole has done a very good job and we'll see where it goes. But I am under the impression, at least that other schools haven't blown him away so much that it's a done deal. And I know that Florida has been hot. They made a big impression on his official visit. I get that. I'm just curious with, and it wasn't long after his Florida visit that he said, I will be making a college decision that will come on June 30th. If you're able to get him to LSU's campus with his family for a full weekend, which is be his third trip in nine months. And then five days later, he's announcing you've put yourself in a good position. So I don't know if it's LSU, Florida. I don't know if Penn state's kind of really in there. I'm, I haven't heard a lot of buzz around George, but we'll have to monitor that. LSU for me is certainly in the top two. I think this weekend decides for me if they're the team to beat. Yeah, I, I think you hit the nail on the head. And, you know, a lot of people looking back on last year's cycle kind of pointed to DJ Chester as maybe the, this is that guy where he's, he's just kind of quiet in a sense, 
but he made visits. Uh, and LSU secured, I mean, quite honestly, a, a silent commitment from him to end the summer. Now, he didn't announce until the week of the Alabama game, but um, Ethan Callaway has a timeline that's moved up. It just potentially seems like this is kind of that similar game plan. Now, North Carolina is much farther than Athens, much farther than well, – I don't, I don't know about much farther than Gainesville, but it's it's a haul, and then it it's Baton Rouge's – you know, farther than Penn State, I would think from there on the map. But um, either way, he's he's leaving the state of North Carolina from what it seems like at this point. And um, LSU is is going to pull out all the stops. I think this is a guy that Brad Davis really, really wants in this class. And um, when you look at his size, I think he could play guard, right tackle, left tackle with his size and how his body's ready made for the college game. That could help him get on the field in so many different ways. Big weekend, big weekend for offensive linemen. Um, yep. We got some skill guys though, Billy. Where are we, where are we starting? Defense or offense? Um, let's let's go. Let's get people on on track in terms of uh, feeling good about things, and uh, that's why I want to lead off with uh, Jelani Watkins, uh, who's one of the fastest players in the entire country, and LSU sits up there as the heavy favorite on the on three uh, RPM. Uh, he is one of the Fastest guys in the country, won the 100, won the 200 meter in Texas. Uh, he sits there uh, as a top 200 overall prospect, uh, number 31 wide receiver overall in the on three industry ranking. He's 5'9", 150, but he can absolutely go. He's very intriguing because not only is he quiet and recruiting, but also it's even hard to dig up stats on this guy. I mean, you go to the Max Peck preps page, and I think his coaches have logged four games. So he is just almost the man of mystery in this 2024 recruiting cycle for LSU. But one thing I'll say is what everyone seems to agree on is that LSU is the team to beat here. I would say if Jelani Watkins didn't end up at LSU, it would probably be one of the shocks of the recruiting cycle for LSU. Well, and he keeps a low profile. That's one thing. I did go digging through his Instagram and on Twitter and all that because kids will share visits or what they're up to. It was only LSU updates. It was just pictures of my LSU visits and then whatever else he has going on. He didn't do a lot this spring because, as you mentioned, he is uber into track. And he back-to-back the 200 meter now in uh, two springs in a row at UIL. Then after that, he ran anchor twice for Klein Forest to finish in first place uh, in 6A. So four state titles, uh, or three, I should say, uh, this offseason, back to back in the 200 uh, as a junior and senior or a sophomore and junior is obviously impressive. Uh, if he's not an early enrollee, he'd be in for a monster track season next spring. But he's got Louisiana ties. LSU's his only official visit this month. And to my knowledge, LSU's the only school he's going and dropping in on at any routine you know, level. And we've talked to LSU sources. He's a take. They want him. So this could end soon. This could end before a senior season, I don't know, but LSU's definitely the team to beat. Yeah, and I, I think this would stack up well. You have Aaron Anderson, you have Kyle Parker, you have JoJo Stone uh, committed. This would be like LSU would be stacked in terms of slot players, guys that can return uh, in, in in kick return and punt return. I mean, they would have so many kind of gadget type players on that roster. It'd be intriguing to see what Mike Denbrock can do with them. Uh, once they're all on campus, if, if they do, in fact, get Jelani Watkins and, and JoJo Stone has said he's shut things down. This is one of those prospects that it just seems it just seems like a foregone c- conclusion. So LSU uh, can maybe put an end to everything this weekend by getting them on campus and locking things down. And uh, obviously you'll take a guy with that type of speed. They just offered Michael Turner, who even if Jelani Watkins jumped on board, Michael Turner would still be a take. John Curtis wide receiver, but um, that has been a long, long time target for Cortez Hankton and his staff. And uh, LSU is looking to uh, put a bow on it this weekend with Jelani Watkins. One other prospect that is hitting campus this weekend is Kai Bates out of the state of Florida. The Orlando area prospect ranks inside the top 200 for us at on three. He's knocking on the door of being a top 100 overall prospect. And personally, I think he's going to end up a top 100 prospect 
on the on three industry ranking when it's all said and done. He's, he stands at nearly 6'2", 177. He's kind of a thick kid. Um, he just has that size to him, and everybody's after him now. Uh, he's been to Alabama. He's been to Tennessee. Um, Florida State is after him. He's quickly rose up the charts as far as LSU goes as being one of the top overall defensive targets. Um, and now LSU gets that last official visit. They're going to turn up the heat and try to get him on board, he would be an unreal pairing with um, Andre Evans at the true cornerback position for LSU. Yeah, we've mentioned they have a lot of commit, not a lot, but they have a number of commits at corner right now. Jawan Johnson can play corner. He can play uh, in the nickel. A guy like Wallace Foster can play corner in the nickel. Uh, Zion Ferguson was their first corner commit coming out of Georgia um, more than a year ago, really, uh, at this point. But then we looked at how do things heat up in that kind of six, seven months before signing day. And Andre Evans blew up. They offered him, got him committed, beat out offers from Bama and Georgia that had recently come. He quickly shut things down and said, I'm all in with LSU. Now Kai Bates is the one after Jalen Crawford a week ago coming to campus on an official visit. who's one of the top corners in the country. They get Kai Bates to campus. I don't consider to Florida to be in this competition really at all. If you're picking a Florida school, it's going to be FSU. As Billy mentioned, he gave FSU, FSU an official visit, gave Bama and Tennessee official visits. He went up to Ohio State and made a visit this month. And it's been in this stretch where he had once said, hey, I want to shut things down before my senior year. And now he's saying, do I let it play out? Like I'm getting so much more interest, including LSU turning up the heat these past few months than I was before. Do I need to reset things? But the reality here is that early on, Robert Steeples did a great job, the LSU corners coach, of getting in with Kai getting in with his coaching staff, getting in with his family. And that relationship has opened the door for LSU in a major way. And it got LSU the final official visit that he's taken this month before the dead period ends. So for me, I go into this one. He's a take, no doubt. And I just look at it as, does LSU try to push and say, hey, don't drag this out any longer. If you want on board, we want you. Let's get this done. And then, as you say, Billy, go back to back with an Evans and Bates. That's about as nice of a one-two punch at corner as you can do at this time of year. I can, I completely agree, and I, I feel like when you look at Kai, I think the the quote that really stood out to me when I talked to him, and he dropped his top schools and his official visits, and I caught up with him. Robert Steeples is is talking to everyone in that camp. I mean, I think he he mentioned he talked to his grandmother and he talked to his mom even before he talked to me today, like. It, he is turning over every stone and I would probably compare Kai Bates maybe. And, and this is kind of stretching it because the timeline probably isn't going to be the same, but he kind of reminds me of JV and Toviano um, in that sense, just kind of how well Robert Steeples played that recruitment last year. So there's, there's plenty of competition for him. Alabama and Tennessee are not going to make it easy on LSU to get him. But I just really feel like this is one of those prospects that he's just done that good of a job. We'll see if it pays off, but LSU getting the last official visit is key on that one. Yeah, so five official visitors. Y'all see why we said at the start of the pod that it was such a big weekend because you've got three offensive linemen, all of which you'd love to have in the class. You've got a wide receiver that has been considered a heavy lean for a while, and now a guy like Kai Bates who is being – courted by a lot of the top schools uh, in the country, but LSU has kind of had an inside track, it feels like, at least from the outside looking in. So if you can add him to the corner class, all the better. But these official weekends become paramount because they're in with family or coaches, whoever it might be, and spending extended time with the staff and meetings and dinners and tours and all that. And that's when you really get a feel for what a program has to offer, how you might fit in, what the vibe is. And those go a long way in determining where you ultimately end up. So big weekend of officials. And, and Billy, it was kind of a big week of unofficials. There were some uh, star power rolling through. Yeah, there was. Uh, and and look, I mean, we're going to lead off with the number one overall prospect in the country being on LSU's campus last weekend. And that's Bryce Underwood. And, and we talked a lot about him earlier, but I did talk with his dad uh, just this morning, um, finally getting a visit recap. And it was just a really special visit for this family. Uh, they got a chance to be in Baton Rouge for his wife's birthday, uh, for Bryce's mom's birthday, Beverly. 
And they spent it at the top of Tiger Stadium, uh, being able to take that in. They did a photo shoot. The whole staff was there for the most part and and just really laid out their plan and and got to build that relationship even more. And President Tate uh, met with the family for 30, 45 minutes. It was just a really good visit overall. I, I think you could see him pop up or pop down, I should say, to LSU for a game since he hasn't done that. But he's also going to visit the likes of Alabama, Georgia, Oregon, USC, and others from what uh, he's told his dad told me. Yeah, I think the biggest thing here is people had wondered two things, and I think you got those answers out of your story, Billy, from talking to the dad. One is Bryce going to decide tomorrow or the next day. Like quarterback dominoes can often fall early. That won't be the case, as you noted. They want to make some visits this fall to see games. Then they want to see where things really stand. So I'll start the calendar at next January and let it go all the way up until the senior year, really, because I think they want to be able to use this time to see more about each college. The other question was, is LSU really in it? And his dad said it. LSU has cemented itself as one of the top teams. We've heard the buzz that it might be LSU Michigan as those two top teams, but a lot of colleges in the mix here. A lot of colleges will continue to recruit him. As we noted on the last podcast, one of the best college or excuse me, high school quarterback prospects to come out in recent years. He's just above and beyond in terms of IQ, what he's done on the field, production already, what he can do with his legs and arm, just a do-it-all five-star. Uh, and that's why he's a five-star plus. So I look forward to seeing where this goes with LSU. Uh, for me, they've done all – Joe Sloan, quarterback's coach, this staff, they've done what they can so far. They're putting themselves in a spot where he came down and visited again, second time in a few months, was here on his mom's birthday, was here on Father's Day weekend. And as his dad told you, it's just about building relationships right now. And Joe Sloan's done a great job with that. So do they get Bryce Underwood? I don't know. Bryce Underwood doesn't know where he's going to school right now. That is still – at least six months off, if not many more months from there. But you want to be able to say, we're not playing from behind. We're not having to catch up. Right now, Bryce Underwood's dad is telling you LSU is one of his top teams. This visit cemented it in his words. That can't go any better for me then. Completely agree. So we'll be tracking Bryce Underwood for a long time, it seems like. Uh, might have to make a trip up to Detroit or, or Michigan, I should say, Bellevue, and uh, check him out this fall. Uh, but – LSU wasn't done hosting unofficial visits, and we transitioned back to the class of 2024 and a trio of massive visitors that got really big-time looks at LSU. And the first one is so important because it's his first, and that's Terry Bussey, five-star prospect out of Timpson, Texas, out there in East Texas, the number one athlete in America, a five-star prospect uh, on the on-three industry ranking. He's in five-star range for both us in 24 um, seven. And he's somebody that is, I, I, I don't want to sit here and say else going to get him, but they are turning up the heat, trying to get him whatever it takes because he could be that big of a difference maker at the safety position. Kerry cooks has been leading that one. And now he's finally made that first unofficial visit with him, not having a timeline LSU at least is putting itself in position to get an official now. Yeah, he's the number one athlete in the country. I like LSU going after him at that DB spot, safety. It's a need. He'd be elite there. Some schools, Billy, are starting to dangle a receiver out there to him, so that's kind of coming into play. I'll say that from everyone we've talked to, including LSU sources, people in Texas, the feeling was that this is Texas and Texas A&M and that LSU might be running third. So the goal is swing for the fences, get him in on an unofficial visit, try to set up an OV at some point, get him in for a game, whatever it might take. And, hey, if LSU's out winning the West again or, you know, makes a playoff run, all of a sudden you could be in the mix for a guy like this. So right now, no, do I think he ends up at LSU? But the longer he remains uncommitted, the longer LSU has a chance to get into it. Yeah, and and by the way, I'll just say this. Uh, just an unbelievable kid. Uh, lost his mom. Um, he, he's, his guardian is the principal at Timpson. Um, and I believe he, he lost another family member close to him, uh, as well. And, uh, has been through way more than anyone else should at his age and still is a 4.0 yes, sir. No, sir. Type of kid. So whoever gets Terry Bussey is getting a, an a one, uh, not only fo football player, but a, a kid too. So LSU's trying to see if it can be them. Um, and wisely so. 
Another prospect that stopped in on campus is one of the best edge rushers in America, Danny Okoye. Um, they don't draw him up uh, too many times like Danny Okoye. Sit, stands at about 6'5", 230, 240. He's a top 100 prospect for on three, the number one prospect in Oklahoma, uh, pretty much across the board, I would say. And he is uh, getting his first look at LSU and is a guy that John Jancic has turned the heat up on in a big way since taking over the outside linebacker recruiting in L at LSU. Yeah, and this is a guy at 6'5", 230 as a junior who could grow into a hand-in-the-dirt defensive end, defensive lineman. Um, he's got that versatility to him, has the frame. Uh, as you see, if you're watching again on YouTube, uh, Bill is doing a good job rolling through all these profiles. The number six edge rusher in the country on, on three. Colin Simmons is right atop their wish list there. They just hosted C.J. Jackson out of Georgia, who's a top 10 edge rusher. Now they get a Koye on campus. And he's coming off a of Texas OV, Billy. And that's really the kickstart of his process. And now he's like, look, I may not decide on anything until like November range. I want to be able to visit more schools. I'm going to take some OVs. So this isn't one that's going to be shut down right now or anytime soon. And that's good for LSU because you want to be able to get in there and really build a relationship. Um, John Jancic, as you said, has done a good job with edge rushers. They'll get Jimmy Lindsay and the whole staff, Matt House, everybody uh, on a guy like Okoye. We saw him hanging out with Frank Wilson uh, during a, you know some visit photos he shared uh, while on campus. He got there on Tuesday, was staying all the way day, all the way through Wednesday. I know he's going to go see Tennessee this weekend. He'll drop into a couple other schools like BAM at the end of the month or before the dead period arrives. So everybody's going after him right now. He is certainly a lead, a top 100 guy on, on three. And I also want to say I fear for the kids in the homeschool league who are going up against a 6'5", 230-pounder that's got college offers from everyone in the country. Yeah, and, and with Danny Okoye, he, the good thing about this one is he's going to take this one to the fall. Um, and so LSU is going to have a lot of time here to work on this one and, and really make that move. Um, I think he's another guy that is so intrigued uh, by LSU with the way LSU has put out defensive linemen, defensive ends, and also defenses as a whole in their history. That's something that he really wanted to go and see for himself. Um, so I think John Jancic, the early returns on him are great. Uh, he's a football guy, but also very particular in terms of how he plans out visits. We talked about that with CJ Jackson. Um, LSU is looking to make a splash here and then lock in an official visit for the fall and, and make that move with Danny Okoye. One guy that they are running out of time to uh, make a move for is Casey Poe, the number one offensive lineman along the interior in the country for on three. Uh, he sits there, you see, uh, Alabama as the on three RPM leader. He's supposed to make his decision on the July 12th. He stopped in on Wednesday uh, for a quick unofficial visit. A big opportunity for LSU to make one more splash before he, one, heads off to Alabama this weekend, and two, makes that decision. Now, LSU will still have their official visit for the fall, but this is one where LSU's playing catch up. They're making that push, and I don't know if it'll be enough, but it was really nice, uh, a nice surprise to see Casey Poe pop in this week. Well, yeah, it just shows that Brad Davis and this entire staff are just because the kid's trending one where it thought to be going one way, they're going to stay on him because they put in time. This is not Casey Poe's first visit to campus this offseason. He's already been through once. So, uh, And on that visit, they had a bunch of the current commits, um, Borderline being one of them. Uh, that said, hey, I met up with him and spent the day with him and got his cell phone, and we've been chatting ever since. So LSU's in his ear. Is that enough? We'll see. Again, Bama's considered a heavy team to beat here, but that's what you got to do. If you want to be on Bama and Georgia's level of recruiting, you battle with them for prospects, and you'll win some, they'll win some, everyone's splitting, you know, however it might go uh, with the pie. You just want your pieces of that pie to become bigger and bigger. That means getting every guy like a Terry Bussey, a Casey Poe, um, whomever it might be, Okoye on campus for visits like this, because every visit counts. They get to spend a little more time around campus, get a little more familiar with things, and it keeps LSU in their head. So it was nice to see them get uh, the number one offensive lineman, number one interior offensive lineman on campus this week. Yeah, no question about it. And, and let's end on a real positive note here, Shay. Um, we'll wrap up with some quick thoughts, and we've talked about them before, but LSU hosted 2025 uh, linebacker Keelan Moses right out of U High. 
um, for the uh, set, uh, the elite camp, and he's been on campus all the time. I mean, if there's one prospect that you probably feel best about in 2025, it's got to be Keelan Moses right now, no? I think you look at Keelan Moses, who, yeah, the younger brother of Dylan Moses. First off, he goes to high school on campus at U High, so he's always around, and he plays his high school football right next to LSU's practice facilities. So his ability to spend time around the coaches, the players, the staff, and really get to know them is a rare occurrence. You know, the kids at U High who have offers who are being courted like that are the only ones who are around that much. And I thought an interesting note just watching camp, which was on the final day of camp. He had already worked out before that. But on the final day of camp, Moses was out there, but he was just hanging out with all the LSU football players who were working camp. He wasn't even going through camp. He was just spending time with guys who are his buddies. A lot of the young guys on this team are guys he grew up playing seven on seven with or against in Friday nights or was around their recruitment or whatever it might be. Or he's gotten to know him since they've gotten to LSU. I am very high on Keelan Moses' chances of ended up at LSU. I know Dylan didn't end up at LSU. I do not think that will be the case the second time around. And uh, it would give LSU and Matt House, someone who loves him, a top 10 linebacker in the country. Uh, and that's exactly what you want to restock that position. Keep guys home. Keep the fence around, not just Louisiana, but certainly Baton Rouge and, and win at U High, which they've lost guys there before, uh, but also get a really talented player and a great kid. Yeah, awesome kid. Uh, he's also getting close to being healthy. Uh, he had a wrist injury. He also had a hammy. So he's ready to getting close to 100 percent and being ready to roll for uh, his junior season. And uh, we'll see. I'm excited to see how he develops. He's, he's got such a big body already, but he's going to be a good one to uh, watch develop overall uh, for the next you know, couple of years. And uh, LSU looks like the early team to beat in a big way. So with that, guys, we're going to wrap up this edition of the Bengal Tiger podcast. A big weekend of recruiting. Don't forget to subscribe to TheBengalTiger.com and also hit us with a subscribe on the YouTube channel. Lots of info, tidbits, and more to come. Be sure to check us out, and we appreciate all you guys who already have as well. So for Shay Dixon, I'm Billy Embody. We'll catch you next time on another edition of the Bengal Tiger Podcast.